That's, that sounds better. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Corlett, and I'm the president and executive director of the Center for Community Solutions. We're a 108-year-old organization dedicated to improving the health, social, and economic conditions through nonpartisan research, policy work, advocacy, advocacy and communications. Uh, my role this morning was to uh, quickly welcome you and then get off the stage. Uh, but I, um, yeah, I feel like I have to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the pain that we're feeling this morning after the murder of 10 black persons in a Buffalo supermarket this past weekend by a young man, young white man, filled with white supremacist ideology. I just pray that these senseless deaths give pause to some of our legislative leaders in Columbus who've been seeking to pass legislation that would outlaw it or make it more difficult for schools, governments, and organizations to talk and teach about the dangers of racism. For what we see is what happens when we sweep it under the rug. It grows, it festers, and it played out in the racist murders of 10 black Buffalo residents. And I also wanna say, Let's also give our black friends, colleagues, and family members some space, some special understanding and grace as they grapple with yet another act of racial terrorism. So please join me in this brief moment of silence to remember those who have tragically lost their lives and to think about what each of us can do to end racism and white supremacy in this country. Thank you. You know, I first also want to thank the Cleveland Foundation, the Gunn Foundation, and the Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation for their support of the Greater Cleveland American Rescue Plan Coalition. And I also want to acknowledge, I, this is always dangerous, I, we're going to introduce our elected officials who are on the panel, but uh, I also want, I know that uh, Westlake Councilman David Greenspan, I saw him here, um, and I saw Akron City Councilman uh, Shamus uh, Malik here. I don't know if there are any other elected officials here, if you want to wave your hand and I can uh, call you out, but I, I know there were some others, that I know Council President from Lakewood, uh, John Litton, was talking about coming this morning. So I'm gonna uh, stop here and uh, introduce CSU President Laura Bloomberg. We're so happy to have her here with us this morning and I will uh, turn over the microphone to her. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. It's, um, it's quite quiet here on campus today, but it hasn't been that way in recent weeks. We just wrapped up three separate commencement ceremonies this week, and I've never had my picture taken so many times. Um, and in the last two weeks, the space where we're sitting, just think about this, has been full of our TRIO graduates and our LGBTQ graduates and our first gen graduates celebrating special, more intimate commencement ceremonies before the big one. So you are sitting, literally sitting in the chairs and standing in the spaces where we are launching the next generation of civic leaders for this community. And I couldn't be more proud. So I just want to tell you briefly, this is, um, I so appreciate your comments, John. Um, I had my phone put away on Saturday as I was delivering welcomes and making comments at two big commencements. So I did not learn about what had happened in Buffalo until I got home Sunday or Saturday evening. And I was thinking about the next day, our law school commencement. I was thinking about today, seeing all of you, and all I could think of was, we will not rescue ourselves if we don't address this horrific issue of white supremacy in this country. I would say it is our imperative, all of us, as people in positions of power or influence or leadership to do that. And so I got up Sunday morning and I had all of these comments prepared for our law school graduates about enduring during a pandemic and being lifelong learners and I just threw it all out. And I wanna tell you briefly what I told them. Our law school here at Cleveland State has the motto, learn law, live justice. And what I told them was that looks really nice on a logo, it's a nice vision. It's better when we live it. So learn and live are two action verbs. And you can fill in the blank, learn, learn 
learn to be a mayor, learn to be a university president for the first time, learn to be a council member, learn to be a civic leader, live justice. I really do believe it is everybody's everyday business. So with that, let me tell you, I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm eager to hear the panel, just like all of you are. I want to tell you an interesting thing that's been happening on campus, knowing that you were coming. We talk about ARP or ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act. In their, in their infinite wisdom, the federal government is recycling acronyms. We also have in this community a very active coalition working on ARPA-H, and it's not the same American Rescue Plan. It's Advanced Research Project Agency for Health. So if you hear people talking about ARPA-H and ARPA, we're talking about two different things. And so at the same time as you're all coming together to think about community solutions around some of these the, the, the rescue plan resources, we're also, as a community, coming together to think about how is it we advance our innovation district around health and think about um, Cleveland as a site for enormous opportunities to look at things like untreated illness and advancing health in underrepresented communities. Two separate things, but you might hear ARPA-H, different thing. Um, again, welcome to Cleveland State. Uh, welcome to this ballroom where we celebrate so many things. and. Um, Again, thank you for the moment of silence. It motivates and inspires me to be a better person. Okay, okay I'd like to, uh, thank you, President. Uh, I'd like to welcome Kate Warren, who's the director of the Greater Cleveland American Rescue Plan Coalition for the Center for Community Solutions, who is gonna call up our panelists and moderate this event. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, thank you, John, and thank you, President Bloomberg, and thank you all for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and invite our esteemed panelists up to the stage. You can come on up and join me on the stage here. Well, thank you again, all of you, for being here this morning. Um, good morning. I want to welcome you to the first public meeting of the Greater Cleveland American Rescue Plan Coalition. Uh, I'm Kate Warren. I am the director of the Greater Cleveland American Rescue Plan Coalition, which is housed at the Center for Community Solutions. Uh, and I want to thank you for attending today. As we're getting started, I invite our audience here in the room, as well as our audience that's watching the live stream on YouTube, or our audience that's streaming the program on WOVU 95.9, to tweet or post about this event on social media. You can use the hashtag ARP in CLE. And if you helped yourself to one of the one pagers that has that hashtag on there for you to refer to, we appreciate your engagement. Um, I also want to encourage you, if you took a note card and you wrote questions for our panelists, if you could kind of um, wave them in the air during this portion of the program, uh, some of our colleagues at the back will come around and uh, collect those questions from you, and we'll make sure to try to get them into the rotation. And with that, let's, uh, let's begin our program. So in March 2020, I don't think that anyone could have fully imagined what the past two years would have looked like for our community. Collectively, we have had to weather quite the storm. The immediate strain felt by our underfunded public health system and our hospitals um, was just the beginning. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown a light on and exacerbated nearly every challenge that our community was already struggling with. You all know the issues because so many of you work on them each day. Issues like an education system that struggled with adjusting to virtual and hybrid learning environments and supporting students' social and emotional needs. An essential workforce that's burned out from overwork and lacking access to basic supports like healthcare, childcare, transportation, a social service safety net that's strained by continuing demand for services to support 
basic needs like food, housing, health care, public benefits, and is facing a possible cliff if the federal public health emergency comes to an end, which should be announced today. Small businesses and arts organizations that have struggled to stay afloat or even closed during a pandemic that upended our economy. A community facing the mental health implications of experiencing collective trauma and increased social isolation for our vulnerable neighbors. And the reality that in Cleveland and around the country, our black and brown neighbors face worse outcomes not only for COVID-19, but for nearly every health metric and that these racial disparities touch each and every issue that I've mentioned. So the American Rescue Plan Act, which we're here to talk about today, is a key part of our federal government's response to these issues. These investments by the Biden administration and state and local governments provide an important opportunity for us to strategically and thoughtfully craft policies and programs that can help provide much needed relief and recovery. It feels more important than ever to get our response right, to leverage this funding for an equitable recovery that works for everyone in our community, especially those on whom this pandemic has had a disproportionate impact. The Greater Cleveland American Rescue Plan Coalition is doing this work of convening and advocating because we want to partner with our local governments in getting this recovery work right. That's why for our first public meeting, we thought it was so important for the community to be able to hear from leaders at Cuyahoga County and at the city of Cleveland about how they are planning for Greater Cleveland's recovery and how they're approaching the use of these ARPA funds to support that recovery. So with that, I would love to introduce our panelists who hardly need introduction. We are joined today by County Executive Armin Budish, who is serving in his second term as County Executive and has also served Ohioans in the House of Representatives where he was Speaker of the Ohio House from 2009 to 2011. He's also an attorney whose legal practice specialized in elder law. Next, we have Mayor of the City of Cleveland, Justin Bibb, who's held office since January of this year after an inspiring election with a slogan I think we can all agree with, Cleveland can't wait. Um, and prior to serving as mayor, he was a leader in the government, business, and nonprofit sectors. Next to him, we have City Council President Blaine Griffin, who has served the Ward 6 community on Cleveland City Council since 2017. And he was elected City Council President by his colleagues in January of this year. Prior to serving on City Council, he was the director of the Community Relations Board and has served the community for decades in community-based organizations and in public service. And next to him, we have County Councilman Dale Miller, who has served on County Council since 2011, representing the second County Council District, which includes part of the west side of Cleveland, the city of Lakewood, and Brook Park. He serves as the chair of the Finance and Budgeting Committee of County Council, and he has also previously served on the Ohio Senate, Ohio House of Representatives, and on Cleveland City Council. Join me in giving our panelists a round of applause and a warm welcome. Thank you so much. And we are going to start the program today by inviting each of our panelists to tell us a bit about your approach to ensuring Cleveland and Cuyahoga County recover from this pandemic, and particularly how you are using ARPA funds and other federal recovery funds to that end. So I'll start with County Executive Budish. Can you Is hear me now? It's still not very hot. Still not good. Here. Uh, can you hear me this? No. Can you hear that? There we go. That's better. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. And uh, uh, thanks for the uh, Center for uh, hosting this event. It's very helpful to have us all get together and talk about these important issues. Um, I want to tell you in advance, I have to leave about 10 or 10, 15, I've got people here that can step in for me to answer more questions. Uh, Michelle Pomerantz and Becky Eby, who have really been uh, key to our ARPA efforts. Um, and as this is, I'm going to Columbus for a previously scheduled event, so, uh, but I definitely wanted to come uh, and be here as much time as I could. 
for the last couple of years, uh, the county and the country have gone through a terrible, terrible crisis. Uh, COVID's killed over 3,600 of our friends and neighbors and family members here. Uh, it's forced the closing of businesses. It's caused many people to lose jobs. It's interrupted kids' education. Uh, it's just been a really tough couple of years. Thankfully, uh, we've come through it uh, pretty well. Uh, I talked to my colleagues around the country and they all feel Cuyahoga County is one of the places that's done the best. But uh, even having done the best, uh, it's been hard and we have more to do. Um, we're getting $240 million approximately from the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, which I'm very excited about. That's a once in a lifetime opportunity for us here in the county. Um, and I will mention that there's even more money available under other federal programs. Uh, so this is really a key time for us. Um, for over a year, uh, we in the county have spent a lot of time studying the rules under ARPA and these other uh, programs to make sure we know what we can legally do uh, to spend the money. Um, and we spent lots and lots of effort uh, to consider how we can maximize the benefits for the residents of Cuyahoga County uh, from these programs. We have solicited input from all over the county, uh, from people in all walks of life. It's been, it's been uh, unique for us. Uh, it's been comprehensive and collaborative. Uh, we've received hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of suggestions and requests for funds. Um, even though we're getting $240 million, I would think that's a lot of money, but as I'm sure the mayor can tell you, it's nowhere near what the needs are in this community. Uh, we've gotten requests far beyond $240 million. Um, and most of the suggestions we've gotten are good ones. Uh, we're working very closely with county council. Uh, we've identified uh, a, a number of projects that satisfy two main goals for us. One is to protect the residents now and to pull us through the rest of this uh, uh, COVID crisis, which is not over yet. And second is to set us up for the future, to transform this region going forward. Generally, the projects that we've identified can be divided into six categories. First is recognizing that the pandemic's not over, using the funds to protect the public from COVID health impacts, things like more PPE, testing, vaccines, and adapting our public buildings uh, to make them safer for people when they come through, to make it safer for our employees when they work there. Second is to protect our children. This includes emergency placements. Right now, when there's a, chi a troubled child or a parent can't take care of a child, frequently they will drop the child off at our Jane Edna Hunter office building. We immediately try to find them a placement, but I will tell you sometimes, especially for the most troubled kids, uh, that is, that is uh, impossible. So they stand, end up spending time in our building. Um, that's not acceptable, so emergency placements we're looking for. And then we're looking to transform the entire uh, child care uh, system by helping place them longer term in a treatment facility or a treatment uh, in, in the community that can help them uh, th into the future. We have a diversion program now for adults uh, and we're looking to create a diversion program for children so they don't have to go to the juvenile court, they don't have to spend time in our office buildings. Housing and homelessness is a third category. Again, we're looking to transform the system Right now, when someone is homeless, we have homeless shelters. We have places that they can go to. But those homeless shelters do not promote, in many cases, independence or privacy. We need to change that. We need to get people ready so that they can live independently. We're transforming our homeless shelters with some of the ARPA money to create more independence and more privacy. And we're looking to increase affordable housing so that when people leave the homeless shelter, there's a place for them to go that they can afford. Fourth is to promote 
an economic recovery for the region. That includes supporting arts and culture, which are critical to our economy here, cleaning up the brownfields, supporting small businesses. Those are all part of this category. Fifth, our major transformative projects. We've already talked about some projects that I believe are transformative, but things like uh, uh, extending broadband across the city and the county, that's something that's critically important. Using microgrids to create the most reliable electricity in the, in the country, maybe in the world, to attract businesses to Cuyahoga County. Marketing the region uh, to businesses that need huge quantities of fresh water, manufacturing businesses that are located in California, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. They shouldn't be doing business there because they don't have water there anymore. If you read the papers, you, you watch the news, it's all drying up. We have it here. We should be attracting those businesses here. Um, we're ramping up a program that we've worked on for workforce training uh, called Sector Partnerships and Intermediaries that some of you are involved in. We're, it's working. We've been training and placing uh, people for the last year, uh, and we're going to ramp that up four or five times. And finally is community development. Uh, that includes the funds that have been put aside for county council to use to support local neighborhood improvement projects. Who better than the local councilman to know what a community needs most? It's the local council people, and I think that's a very useful program. Uh, and I want to also mention one more thing. We've been, we've been talking about ARPA, and this uh, forum is to talk about ARPA, but there are other programs out there. And one of the things that we've had to do is make sure that we're not using ARPA money for projects that can be funded with other funds. An example is the uh, Emergency Rental Assistance Program. It's critically important that we support people so they can stay in their apartments. Congress has made available funds for that purpose. We don't want to use ARPA for that. We've already spent $25 million on emergency rental assistance in the county. We've got $75 million more coming forward for emergency rental assistance. That's very important, and we, cannot, we can avoid using ARPA for that. Um, we've hired two grants people in the county to help us identify uh, uh, projects and programs that are available out there, find the pots of money that the federal government is making available uh, for the first time ever in many cases uh, so that we can maximize the benefits for people in Cuyahoga County. I know I've gone over my time. Thank you. Thank you, County Executive. And Mayor Bibb, could you tell us a little yeah. bit about your plan? Well, I think the, the executive said everything. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I want to just set the context for this conversation because it's very important. And Kate alluded to this, but this is an historic amount of money that Cleveland and the region may never get again. Probably the most money our community has gotten since the New Deal when FDR was president. And for all of us in this room, it's easy to get to the what. What should we spend the money on? But I think the how, the how is just as important as the what. So since taking office on January 3rd, uh, my administration has been very focused on creating a very deliberate, focused, and strategic process to make sure we deliver the right ROI for our residents long term because these investments are not just about the next three or four years, but how will these investments position Cleveland in 2030, 2040, and 2050? So to that end, we are doing a couple things. Number one, uh, we are creating what we are calling the Center for Economic Recovery, which consists of my senior strategy policy team in my administration that's working across the entire government to make sure we have a focused approach in terms of how we spend this money. Secondly, you know, I'm a big believer in looking all across the country to get best practices. And so we've been lucky to really get some good counsel from experts at Brookings and the Fund for Economic Future to really help the administration determine what's been working nationally as cities spend this ARPA money and how do we take those best practice locally to make sure we get it right in Cleveland, Ohio. In terms of our priorities, um, obviously the budget 
is a major issue. Uh, and we are really looking forward to working with city council to make sure we leverage the ARPA money to stabilize the budget first and foremost. Secondly, an inclusive economic development. We know that many parts of our city, particularly in the east side, were hardest hit during this pandemic. And we wanna make sure that we can use the ARPA funds as an initial down payment for a Marshall Plan to bring back the east side. We've already made, I believe, a good amount of progress on our investments to eradicate lead paint, uh, investments to really bridge the gap around the digital divide, but also, also it's important that we use these investments to make sure we can invest in catalytic projects and catalytic initiatives to finally address the public safety crisis we have in Cleveland. I don't need to tell you that we have a gun problem in our city. And until we have innovative programs to address public safety, we will not be a city of opportunity that works for everyone. Just Friday, President Biden welcomed mayors and police chiefs from across the country talking about how we intend to use this money to address our public safety needs. The other thing I want to mention is this. You know, I spent nearly two years knocking on doors and listening to the residents of this city. Our residents know what needs to be done in our community. That's why we want to allocate a portion of the American Rescue Plan investments to fully uh, support participatory budgeting in all 17 wards where residents can work with the members of council to invest in hyper-local projects that improve the lived experiences of their respective communities. I also think it's important that we structure our investments in a way that will generate long-term revenue for the city. We can't invest in things that are gonna create long-term expenses for the city. So these investments must be done in a balanced and budget neutral way to ensure we're being fiscally responsible long-term. So in addition to these core priorities that we've identified in our administration, it's also important that we have a very crystal clear evaluation criteria. Are the projects gonna be focused on equity and inclusion? Are they gonna position Cleveland to not just be competitive nationally, but globally? What will be the longevity of these investments? So having a very crystal clear evaluation framework is gonna be very important to make sure we have the right level of accountability in place to ensure that we can generate the right ROI for these investments long-term. In closing, I, I wanna just say this. If we believe that one-off projects is the best way to spend this money, we are sadly mistaken. If we squander this moment, we will look back and say we missed an opportunity. And so my administration is committed to making sure we focus on the how, not just the what, and that we have a very crystal clear process to ensure that these investments are strategic and catalytic and that we'll, they will ensure that we can truly create a more equitable, just future for the city of Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bibb. Council President Griffin. Thank you so much. And just, just wanna say it's an honor and a privilege to be here today among so many people who I know that have been working very hard over the last uh, few years, really to help the city uh, be successful. It's also good to see everybody in person uh, instead of behind of a Zoom screen. So glad to see everybody here today. Uh, let me just say this. City Council has been focused, as we were last year, in really trying to make sure that we do the blocking and tackling of government. We've taken a practical approach of how we want to work with uh, these ARPA dollars. I know there's going to be a lot of nice, colorful, um, you know, proposals that are sent to City Council, but number one, is what Mayor just said, is to make sure that we focus on economic recovery. Uh, last year, we had approximately $108,000 that we use in economic recovery, uh, one-time money that we had to use in order to fill what we have for lost revenue. And one of the things that we have to recognize is that these ARPA dollars have to help us come up with some solutions in how we actually stabilize Cleveland and how we actually create more revenue in the city of Cleveland. 
we've pretty much kept it general at Cleveland City Council and focused on the broad buckets and look at other examples and best practices from other cities. Uh, one of the things we look at, as uh, the county exec said, is to focus on what ARPA dollars are to do first, which is public health, making sure that we have more vaccinations, making sure that we are, um, you know, doing, making, making sure that we have access to health care and quality health care, making sure that we um, have the PPE, because one of the things that was exacerbated through this process is that we offshored so much of our uh, ability and capability to build some of those kind of things and masks and other things here that we ran into shortages and you're starting to still see shortages like that with Similac and baby milk and other things like that. So really trying to make sure that we focus on health and stability and wellness of our community. The other thing is services to disproportionately impacted communities. We know that um, there have been communities that where some communities have caught a cold, other communities have caught the flu. And what we want to do is to make sure that those communities that have been disproportionately impacted have great opportunities for affordable housing, have great opportunities and access to lead, I mean, uh, to health care, and then also making sure uh, that we deal with safety. Uh, one of the other things is negative impact, negative economic impacts. Uh, we know that one of the things that emerged through this crisis is really making sure that we have smart manufacturing and industry 4.0 so that we can train people that can work remotely. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the capability and have the infrastructure in place so that a lot of the folks that are at home can work uh, from home. So in city council, once again, few things that we've already invested in, public safety. We made a very uh, a concerted effort to support public safety. The biggest request that we got at the local level, as well as through all of our council members, was that we wanted more cameras. So a lot more cameras have been put up. There was a, a also a focus on broadband, a focus on making sure that we had the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, and we invested in a lot of affordable housing options. One of the things that has also been exacerbated through this process is domestic violence. One of the things that we really wanna focus on is focus on helping some of those folks who have experienced domestic violence either through child abuse or through domestic abuse with spouses. So those are things that a lot of people are not talking about that's not sexy, uh, but those are things that are important to our, to our community. Last but not least, when I talk about housing, um, we wanna make sure that we double down on some of the programs that we've already had in place. Right to counsel is extremely important. I know I see my good friend Colleen Cotter here uh, because so many tenants were dealing with housing insecurity and uncertainty through this process. So we want to make sure that we have uh, our right to counsel program strengthened so that we can make sure uh, that people who are living in those circumstances have someone there to fight for them. We know demolition is important and we know outdoor spaces and other things like the United Way's first call for help, uh, 211, need to be funded as well. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a great opportunity, an unprecedented amount of money, but we also have to be practical and we have to make sure that we support and buffer our city services through this process, that we can't get too fancy. This is about blocking and tackling and making sure that basic city services are, are served for the people of the city of Cleveland, yet make sure that the investments that we make help us to be able to become visionary and be able to, uh, be, able to be catalytic in all of the things that we just mentioned. Thank you so much. Thank you, and County Councilman Dale Miller. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of County Council regarding our plans for the American Rescue Plan funds. Cuyahoga County received just under 240 million. Council has worked collaboratively with Executive Butish to plan for the beneficial use of these funds. The ARPA funds provide us an opportunity to respond to the major challenges our community faces meeting basic needs, responding to the pandemic and improving health care, workforce and economic development, community development, education, responding to climate change, and improving equity and diversity. The spending framework that the executive and council agreed to includes initiatives in all of these areas. 
I'll give you the highlights, but you don't have to furiously take notes. The complete list is on our website. Just go to the Cuyahoga County Council's homepage and look in, to the right under featured items. For meeting basic needs, we plan to provide $5 million to the Greater Cleveland Food Bank for their construction of a new, larger facility and reorganization of their existing facility to create a one-stop shop for social and economic benefits. We're also providing $2.1 million to the Western Reserve Area and Agency, Agency on Aging for basic services to seniors. On pandemic response and health, we're providing $1.5 million for testing and contact tracing, $750,000 for PPE, $507,000 for inmate testing, $1.8 million for lead paint mitigation, and $1 million for the facility upgrade at Hitchcock House, a center for women recovering from alcohol and drug abuse. On workforce and economic development, we're planning to provide $9 million for workforce programs, $9.5 million for economic development to take advantage of our fresh water assets, $3.3 million for arts and culture, $2 million for small business assistance, $5 million for brownfield remediation, $5 million to help upgrade our convention center, and $2.5 million for the Irish Town Bend project to help keep the Cuyahoga River shipping lane open. On housing and homelessness, we're proposing $20 million to expand our homeless shelter, $3 million for affordable housing gap financing, $2 million for vacant and abandoned housing demolition, $1 million for youth emergency housing, and $5 million for a youth diversion center. On community de development, we've set aside $86 million for community grants for significant local projects. We also plan to provide $2.2 million for the Central Neighborhood Recreation Center. On environment and climate response, we're planning on $1 million for assistance with rooftop solar, $1 million to assist municipalities with stormwater retention projects, $600,000 600, for microgrid projects to help with sustainable energy, and 350,000 to create a tree nursery to grow healthy young trees for our planting program. I've been especially active in working on the environmental programs and expect that we will have more before this is said and done. On education, we're proposing 2.5 million to help students pay overdue college expenses and facilitate their return to school. On diversity and inclusion, we're planning to spend $20 million on broadband expansion to help address the digital divide. There are differing opinions on how best to do this, but we're committing to taking action, and the first hearing on this initiative starts at 10 o'clock this morning in the Community Development Committee. Finally, we've agreed to hold back $53.6 million to be decided after the next executive comes on board to allow consideration of ideas that take more time to be developed. This program is a wide-scale response to our community's most pressing problems and will have a positive impact on our quality of life. The one criticism I could anticipate is that we should focus on a small number of high-impact programs rather than threading it around. However, Cuyahoga County's problems are all interrelated. Our approach aims at a simultaneous community improvement in all key areas, and I believe it will work. I look forward to further discussion and your questions. Thank you to all of our panelists for, um, for sharing about your approach and your plans and your ideas. I, I'm very grateful to hear more insights. Um, so since we are blessed to have on the stage folks from the city and the county, I would be remiss to not ask, how will all of you work together, both as different branches of government and between the city and the county, to have a greater impact? 
uh, as you're spending these funds. And, and maybe we'll switch up the order this time so we'll have Mayor Bibb and then yeah. Com Council President Griffin uh, respond first to this question. Yeah, uh, really important question, Kate. A couple things, number one, um, you know, I think there's a lot of alignment already between the city and the county. I know that uh, I've talked to the county executive and uh, the county council president about some alignment on some of our key spending priorities. Uh, in terms of city council, I know that there uh, is a lot of alignment in terms of my priorities as mayor and the council's priorities. Uh, we are two different branches of government and city council is embarking on their process. The administration is embarking on our process, but I believe that when we come together, we'll have a very smart and, and thoughtfully laid out legislative docket around ARPA spending uh, that really serves the needs of our residents. And it's important uh, to note that I think all of us have talked about the importance of equity and centering this work around a resident voice. And I believe that we share that commitment and philosophy. Uh, and I also believe that we all share a commitment around not just using uh, this process around ARPA to work better together, but how can the city and the county uh, work more collectively around the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the other uh, federal uh, investments coming down the pipeline to ensure that the region is well positioned uh, for the future. Thank you, Council President. Sure, and I would just uh, echo what the mayor said. There has to be alignment. We have no choice but to be aligned on this. In order for us to be able to uh, have the impact that we need, we need to make sure that all of us are really talking and working close together. Uh, when I've had discussions with the mayor and others around the use of these dollars, we share the same ideas. Um, it's always gonna be the details. Um, he's fortunate to have 8,000 or so people that um, he, gets to hire and fire, and I happen to have 17 people who I have to negotiate with. So there's a little bit of a nuance there that we have to deal with. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we just, uh, you know, we are working close together, met with his uh, chief strategy officer, Bradford Davey. Uh, we, you know, we're in a time of collaborative leadership. We're at a time where our community wants us to be transparent, um, you know, housing, safety, all of these things are things that we're already aligned with. The one thing that I want to make sure that everybody knows, and I'm going to say this, and I want to make sure everybody takes it the right way, we're, um, we're, we, we know the headwinds that are coming our way. The mayor, the county exec, Councilman Miller, we know where the shortfalls in funding and budgeting and other things are, are in place. And the community has elected a lot of us to be representative leaders. So it's imperative and important for us to really talk with each other and align uh, because we have so many multiple constituencies that we serve. So I think the alignment question is really we're gonna fall in line. You won't see a lot of disruption over this. You'll pretty much, we pretty much know where we have to, uh, where we have to uh, surgically focus Focus on anyway. Thank you. County Executive Budish. Thank you. Uh, so they've said it. Uh, we are at a very fortunate time in our in our county and city history. We get along. And we get along well. And I think we actually like each other, which helps. Uh, so uh, between the county uh, executive branch and the council, we've worked very well together. The whole program that we've been working on uh, has been worked through council and the executive branch uh, from step one all the way through. Um, and uh, as far as the city of Cleveland and the county, uh, Mayor Bibb and I meet often, uh, not just about ARPA, but you know, it's, all, it's all out there. And uh, I don't think, for example, that there's an economic development project that goes on in the city that we don't talk about. Um, you know, Tanya's here, and uh, I know Tracy Nichols is here, and you know, the, you know, you guys know, you know, you come to, you know, the city and the county, and we all try to work together, and that's really positive for the region. Um, and it's not just that, you know, the, the broadband, we're, we're working together to try to work it out. The, the uh, uh, homelessness issue, the, the uh, food insecurity, uh, when someone mentioned the food bank, Mayor Bibb smiled and, and you know, we chatted a bit because you know, we're both interested in that and we've got to work together. So you know, leveraging our funds together and our approach is critically important, and I think everybody up here and others know that. 
Councilman Miller. So I'm going to add two specifics, and the first is community development. Just in my district, the city of Lakewood and the city of Cleveland <coughs> both have their own municipal ARPA money in addition to the county's money. And I think there's a real opportunity for us to, uh, to pool our resources and put together some larger community development projects that would be uh, more than, than either of us could do alone. And so that's a tremendous opportunity. And the second is the area of broadband, which both the city and the county have prioritized. And we, we can't have the city and the county walking all over the same territories and doing different things. We have to uh, have a very close coordination and, and come up with a plan that the uh, city and the county do together. Thank you all for your responses. I know I'm heartened to hear about the collaboration between the city and the county, and I, I know we also have a room of, of willing people who, who care about these issues in the community and would also wish to partner with you as you're developing your programs and carrying them out. So, um, so we look forward to ongoing collaboration with this coalition um, with the leaders on this stage. Um, County Executive Butish, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about the process that the county used to develop its proposals around ARPA funding, um, and how did the set of proposals that were developed rise to the top? Uh, thank you. Um, as, as I mentioned to start, we've been working on this for a year. So, I mean, this has been a long uh, and detailed pro process. Um, we put up a, a website and invited the community to give us their thoughts, suggestions, uh, and recommendations. And you all did. I mean, we got hundreds of recommendations, uh, and most of them were pretty good. I have to say, I've looked at every single one. Uh, and I know that council has also taken advantage of that opportunity. We've gone through them, and, and they've been extremely helpful. Uh, in addition, we met with all kinds of organizations and groups uh, to help us uh, uh, figure out what to do uh, that would be impactful for the community. So, you know, we've got internal groups, we've got external groups, we've got a, an advisory committee for seniors, we've got an advisory committee for equity, we have an advisory committee for children, you know, and we've met with them to talk about ARPA. Um, we have a great set of, uh, uh, of directors and, and leaders within the community. We don't have 8,000, but we have uh, uh, a number, uh, more than more than Blaine, fewer than uh, Mayor Bibb. <laughs> but uh, uh, we've gone to them and said, please give us your, your input. And they did. And they've gone over the suggestions that have come from the community. And they're the ones that have uh, uh, narrowed it down. And with the help of, of Becky and Michelle and others, you know, we bring it together. Uh, and, and that resulted in, in the uh, uh, program. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Councilman Miller. Um, Councilman Miller, can you talk about how County Council is approaching its decision-making process around the county's ARPA allocations overall? And if you have any insights into how County Council might approach decisions around the 86 million in discretionary funds that have been proposed? Uh, yes, on, on the overall allocation, uh, we agree with the County Executive on a program that addresses all of the major uh, areas that we're dealing with that I uh, discussed in my opening presentation. Regarding the community development funds, first I would point out that, that under the county's charter, uh, it's not permitted that any one council person make any funding decisions. And what this means is that that every program or project that's considered will have to be uh, submitted to the county through the, through the regular legislative process and be considered by all of the council members and then sent to the executive for his action. The second thing is that Council President Purnell Jones wisely recommended and the council agreed that there is going to be a standard application for, for these community development funds, which uh, provides information about the uh, 
the organization that's submitting the request, their, their, their capabilities, the, the specifications of the projects, what its projected benefits are, and, and how it impacts diversity, how it impacts the environment, what the uh, leverage and benefits are, and a number of other questions. So we'll, we'll have a, uh, a pretty wide-ranging and, and broad set of information about, about each of the uh, proposals. The third thing is that each council member will develop their own fair and high integrity process to ensure that, that the projects agreed upon effectively meet the needs of their community. And these programs are going to differ a little bit from, uh, from district to district. In, uh, in my second county council district, I've decided to send out a, a request for proposals and, and we're going to have a uh, a scoring committee of about seven people, which will include county council staff and some administration staff and me, because I would prefer that the recommendations not come from, from me individually, but be based on a broader input. And so that's, uh, that's my personal pr uh, preference. So that's, uh, that's the general approach that we're going to be taking. I'll just ask a follow-up because I know folks in the room will be interested. Where can they find information about how to submit applications to county council for these funds? Uh, about the community development yeah. funds in particular? Yes. My, uh, if, if you're interested in my district, the... Uh, the request for proposals is uh, is on the website in the same place as as the uh, the broader list. It's on the uh, county council homepage in the right hand corner where it says fe featured items. As as far as any other county council district, I would s suggest that you. Uh, simply call the council person whose, whose district your proposed uh, program or project is going to be located in, and they can give you further information on, uh, on, on where to send it. Also, uh, you could just generally uh, uh, obtain the, uh, the application form and, and send it to Trevor. Trevor McAleer, who's the uh, county council's uh, uh, budget policy analyst who's uh, coordinating these applications. Thank you, Councilman. Um, the next question is for Mayor Bibb. I was wondering if you could talk about what function your proposed Center for Economic Recovery would serve uh, and how you plan to develop proposals around the city's ARPA allocations through that center. Yeah, <clears throat> so I started thinking about this uh, January of last year once we got word that the city of Cleveland was receiving uh, $512 million from the Biden administration. Uh, I was lucky to have some good counsel from a dear friend and advisor, Brad Whitehead, who's at the Fund for Economic Future who was doing some of this work with mayors uh, across the country as they were thinking about their first tranche of American Rescue Plan investments. And one of the things that he really reinforced for me as a candidate uh, for mayor, and now that I'm in the executive seat now, was number one, how do we turn this 512 million into three to four or five billion uh, over time? And then secondly, how do we make sure that we have a very coordinated approach at the city, county, and state and federal level to ensure that we're maximizing the right return on investment for these dollars. Uh, that led to the creation of a Center for Economic Recovery, which really is a dedicated strategy team uh, in my administration that works with council, uh, that works with uh, community-based organizations, foundations, nonprofits, and the banking sector to ensure that we are syndicating and evaluating the right kind of proposals that are mapped to my core priorities uh, as mayor. And this is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, we cannot afford to squander and waste the money, first and foremost. 
I think secondly, uh, the residents of Cleveland are deserving and want to make sure that we leverage these dollars in a very transformative way. And I would also say this, um, I also truly believe in the principles of participatory budgeting. Uh, and so it's our uh, initial thought to uh, propose up to $5 million uh, in our civic participation fund as one of our core priorities so that residents in all 17 wards can work with their members of the city council to invest in those hyper-local projects that will improve their lived experiences. But for us, it was all about not just the what, but the how. And that's so important to make sure we have a very focused and strategic approach to these investments long term. Can I just add one thing? Sure. Because uh, I was listening to the mayor and uh, triggered a thought. Um, we're not only working together between us, but we're working together to leverage these funds with others. So we are talking to the state about broadband assistance. Uh, we're uh, 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 talking to um, uh, other organizations about partnering with us. Um, with the uh, Brownfields, for example, we're talking about ways that we can leverage our funds with state money. So uh, leveraging is a key, and by working together and with others, uh, I think we have a good chance of leveraging even more. And, and one more point I want to add to this. It, it's so important to make sure we have a crystal clear criteria for these dollars, because if, if we use the money from American Rescue Plan uh, investments that we could have used to support the general fund, then we're tying up capital that we don't need to tie up, right? And so we have to have a very crystal clear approach to this process to make sure we're using the right dollars for the right kind of programs in the city of Cleveland to use the right capital long term. Thank you, Mayor and County Executive. Um, Council President Griffin, can you share what did the city learn during the process of allocating the first tranche of ARPA funding? And what changes will City Council be looking to make to the process with this second tranche? Well, uh, I'm glad that you asked that question because, you know, we had to do this in the middle of a lot of transition. And we had a transition from administrations, from the past administration to the present administration. We had several council members that actually uh, were, um, that were here that are not here anymore. So we had a lot of transition that we had to uh, experience. One of the things that we also recognized is that, um, you know, the, the rules really, to be quite honest with you, didn't get finalized until approximately about two or three, maybe about a month ago. Uh, so the goalposts moved a few times. So just when we thought we settled on a few things, uh, the rules would come back and be adjusted. So in making sure we needed to stay in compliance has been critical and making sure that we, um, you know, work on um, making adjustments. The other thing that I want to just say is that, um, you know, I want to touch on a couple of questions you asked, you know, the, the mayor and the council uh, and the uh, councilman Miller is that, um, we actually had a significant process that we had intake. Um, I know myself, I had several meetings in the ward where we got ideas on what people wanted to see. So when you ask me, what did people want to see? If I could tell you I break my area down into eight different areas, is eight different priorities of what people pretty much wanted to see. Uh, so really, that's the reason why I keep going back to how council people and mayors really have to work together because there's such a diversity of opinions from the community. And really to be an arbitrator of those ideas in order to synthesize those ideas in order to try to have a win-win for everybody is what's been one of the more challenging things. Um, last but not least, uh, I do want to also echo to make sure that we leverage these dollars. One of the first acts that the mayor worked with me as council president to do is to work with private, um, private nonprofit Cleveland Clinic in order to make a $17 million investment, 8.5 this year and 8.5 next year and leverage that in order to come up with a $50 million investment and more to come uh, in order to make homes led safe in the city of Cleveland. So really, I think once again, that word alignment, everybody being on the same page, really trying to you know get input, but also being in a position to make decisions as leaders. The last thing that I will say, which I think is critical, is um, 
we actually did not vote on approximately, we spent approximately 170 million and it was about 85 million, 85.6 million remaining. And the reason that we did that is because probably the biggest tranche of requests that we got was from economic development tools. So instead of rushing it last year, we kicked it to this year so that we could work with the new administration in order to be able to leverage the dollars and be able to work towards the future. So really the timing, the transition, and making sure that we kind of held the ship together until the new team got in place is what was most difficult. Thank you, I, I appreciate that perspective, Council President. Um, so this question is for, for each of the panelists, and, and many of you have already touched on this in your earlier remarks, but we know that the pandemic has exacerbated many of the racial health and economic disparities that already existed in our community before the pandemic. And really a key part of this ARPA legislation is geared toward ensuring that communities that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic have access to whatever they need to recover uh, and hopefully be better off than they were before. So how will you consider these racial disparities in planning your spending and how will you measure your success? And for this, I'd like to start with the county executive. Thank you. Um, everything we do, everything we do, not just with ARPA, considers uh, equity. Um, if you look at what we do, you know, you'll see it reflected in the programs that I and, and Councilman Miller just talked about. Um, with, uh, as you pointed out, the pandemic ex pointed up and exacerbated uh, existing uh, uh, un unfairnesses in the community. So for example, uh, we saw that testing uh, for the pandemic was not being uh, equitably uh, provided throughout the community. We saw that vaccines were not being utilized equitably across the county. We happen to be very fortunate. We have an excellent board of health, and we have a county hospital called Metro Health that was very willing to help us. We invested additional funds in both of those. They went out, Metro especially went out and provided extra uh, effort, extra uh, uh, efforts in in underserved communities to make sure that vaccines were available, to make sure the testing was going on, and, and that was critical. But, you know, and then, you know, listening to all the projects that, you know, we, we have already outlined, things like broadband, that impacts uh, underserved communities more than anybody else. They're the ones that have trouble affording the services. Um, uh, you know, when you, you look at uh, the um, homeless issue, that impacts uh, uh, people of color more than others. The, um, the food insecurity that both the mayor and I have talked about uh, impacts uh, people uh, of color more than others, uh, although certainly all these things affect people across the county. But um, if you look at what we do, we consider equity in every single thing. We've even created in our general work uh, what we call equity zones, which are based on uh, historic redlining, and we are providing additional services in those uh, historically redlined areas. You know, I think it's important to be as explicit as you possibly can to get resources in parts of the city that were hardest hit from the pandemic. And mind you, uh, these parts of the community were um, going through a crisis before the pandemic. The pandemic only exacerbated it. Um, a couple of things that we're exploring. Number one, uh, we're in conversations with some local and national partners about uh, a universal basic income program uh, pilot for black women to help them start businesses in uh, the hardest parts of our city. Um, you know, you think about focused investments for Marshall Plan for the East Side so that commercial corridors in Lee Harvard, Union Miles, uh, and Buckeye uh, get the resources they need so they can be thriving long term. Uh, you think about structuring a revenue oriented housing fund to support seniors so they can have the right home report, home repair uh, support they need uh, and you know so they can age in place and live a life of dignity. We have an aging population that we have to plan for. And so as explicit as we can be, it's so important to really right these structural wrongs that have plagued Cleveland for a long time. 
You know, a couple of things that I just want to make sure that we we look at with this, and and, and you asked earlier about what was one of the more difficult decisions, and that's making sure that we focus on equity and that all areas of the city of Cleveland get served. Um, I could tell you, I have a Dickensian model of award, which we have some of the more affluent areas of the city of Cleveland, but then we have areas that have a tremendous amount of poverty. And Cleveland is like that, where you have pockets of you know, thriving, successful um, communities, but then you have areas that are, you know, people are living on the margins of society. So really making sure that we identify where those areas are um, is something that's critical. And something that is very critical is home ownership. Through this process, one of my colleagues really came up with a great idea, which is uh, something that we've looked at in other cities that they've been using, is uh, to use some of these dollars for gap financing. Uh, because we know that a lot of people have problems with gap financing, which we could use some of this money in order to secure and stabilize neighborhoods. Also using it for other things to go into hard hit areas like uh, mobile clinics, where we have uh, two mobile clinics, where we know it was areas like Fairfax and Huff that had low vaccination rates, and we were able to get people to go to where folks are in order to pr provide those services. Um, so I would tell you that, you know, it's, it's critical for us to really um, identify those hard to hit areas because people kind of mistake equity and equality. There's a difference between equity and equality. And that's the challenge is really making sure that people understand that this is about equity and making, um, making investments in areas that are traditionally left behind. And we know where those areas are. Uh, Center for Community Solutions does a great job helping us identify where those areas are. So we have the GIS information to show us where we should be targeting, and that's what we've been trying to stay focused on. So uh, County Executive Butish really hit, hit the nail on the head. The, uh, the uh, council and the executive a, a couple years ago passed legislation declaring systemic racism to be a, a public health emergency. And and, and since that time, it's been our intention and our effort to uh, to handle everything that we do through uh, through an equity lens and 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 to uh, try to make progress on it in, in everything that we do. I would uh, particularly mention three areas. Uh, the first is workforce. The uh, the workforce development programs uh, are, are heavily targeted at at, uh, at people who are unemployed and and are overrepresented in minority communities. The uh, the second is broadband, and we're uh, specifically uh, targeting areas where the current penetration is the least and where there's affordability issues and, and so we're being very intentional about that. And and the third one is, is the small business assistance and I would point out that uh, in the previous uh, set of funding the, uh, the, uh, the uh, coronavirus assistance round uh, we did quite a bit of small dis business assistance and it was uh, it was designed and very carefully uh, prepared with with a strong equity focus and and we measured the results and 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 it was uh, was something something in the general area 50% of the money went to uh, uh, minority owned or female owned businesses and, and so uh, we uh, we measured it and and uh, and and we did very well. So uh, that's going to be our continuing focus. Thank you all for your responses to that question. I I I want to make sure we have time for our audience's question. I know many of you have uh, excellent questions. If you're still hanging on to a note card, if you would just sort of stick it in the air, and Emily will come around and grab it from you. But um, I'm going to pass my, my microphone to my colleague, Alana Garrett-Ferguson, who is going to read for our panel uh, some of the questions that came from the audience. Thank you all for being here today. So our first question, it seems that ARPA funds can be used to help improve systems that aren't functioning well now. Are there any examples of ways that you want to do that? 
And we're going to do a little shuffle here because County Executive has to leave for Columbus. So let's thank him for joining us today. I'll, I'll give Michelle some time to get settled and I'll take this one. Um, so one of the key priorities that, that we announced on Friday uh, for our ARPA uh, investments was around uh, having a more modern and responsive city hall. Uh, and you know, I believe systems like 311, it may seem very basic to some, but it's so important that we have a one-stop shop for residents to call city hall to have a follow-up from various departments about grass cutting, pothole repair, et cetera, particularly for our seniors who don't have access to the internet as much as other generations in our community. So fixing those legacy systems is so important for us to truly have a modern and responsive city hall for the 21st century. Other systems, uh, like our permitting process, uh, having the ability to get a permit online or in the library all those things are on the table for us to make sure we can have a, a more modern and responsive city hall for the 21st century. So uh, I can add that uh, the uh, county's program on, on the uh, homeless uh, system is, is a good example. We're, uh, we're trying to improve the system so that uh, uh, that homeless people are served in, uh, in, in less congregate and less compact facilities where, where it's uh, safer from, from a coronavirus perspective and, and, it's, it, and it's more livable. And so we're, we're expanding, uh, we're, we're expanding our, our space availability and also working to provide additional locations so, so that uh, that we can disperse the population more and, and provide better service. And so, so that would be a, a significant uh, system improvement that, that this money will help bring about. So I would say a few things. Uh, one is public safety. There's a tremendous opportunity in order to enhance our technology. I know that a lot of people across city council are very frustrated with some of the police chases that we're seeing. And there's a lot of technology that can be utilized in order to help um, our safety forces operate um, in a more efficient manner. I know that there's a lot of questions about civil liberties as it pertains to cameras and other things, but I do think that we have a great opportunity to really enhance our public safety system through drones and other technology that that can help us have tools in place in order to um, you know, handle some of our most pressing sa safety issues. I will tell you that we have a tremendous opportunity to address mental health. Uh, mental health through this process has been a challenge. A lot of people do not talk about this, but our domestic violence numbers have been through the roof through this process. So making sure that we have systems in place to identify uh, you know, these systems that can help support the, the people that are being abused in this process um, is, is some ways that we can work with that. I would also tell you that 211 is important because a lot of people wanted to come into uh, needed services and didn't know who to call. A lot of people who were, um, you know, never have experienced this kind of distress before, need to have a simple way of being able to communicate where can they get services for housing, food, social services, other things. And one of the most important things that was exacerbated through this process is that more children uh, were not getting tested uh, for lead. And making sure that we have testing and screening, and and uh, Mayor and myself and a couple of other people had a great opportunity to meet with the head of Medicaid approximately two or three weeks ago, and we see some tremendous opportunities in meeting with the heads of those hospitals in order to enhance our testing system so that we can make sure that we're successful as we're trying to uh, take this whole canary in the coal mine process around 
uh, lead exposure and change that narrative and now try to make sure that we uh, show that we're that we have stable housing safe housing but we need to make sure that we test these children to make sure uh, that they are uh, not being exposed to lead so there's several opportunities um, in order for us to enhance and streamline the services that we're doing and once again that word that you used earlier alignment in order to get it done Awesome, so our next question comes from audience member Lou. Look at today's attendance. Who is still missing? From, what has, from who has been impacted and will continue to be impacted? How can we include more grassroots organizations and individuals that can decide on how ARPA funds will be spent? Not just ideas, but actually where the dollars go. I'll take first crack at this. Um, that's what we're here for. Our job is not only to try to make people come to us. Our job is to go to people and be able to understand and, and, and help hear the voices of people. Last week, I had the opportunity with Lou uh, to go and talk to the uh, Homeless Congress and really get a sense of what's important to them. I spend Every week, I spend more time trying to walk neighborhoods, talk to people, because everybody cannot get out to a meeting at Cleveland State. Everybody can't come somewhere. So it's important, as uh, Councilman Miller mentioned earlier, as a council person, to stay on the ground to make sure that you're hearing from different opinions, that you don't just surround yourself around people who, um, as we say in the black church, speak to the choir. As you actually get out there and talk to people about what do they want. I go and I talk to, uh, you know, Rose of Sharon on 83rd and Cedar. What do you want? I go and I talk to uh, Miss, Miss Quinney over on 103rd and Union. What do you want to see? So really getting a diversity of opinions and making sure that we become translators and advocates for the people who we serve and bring them to rooms like this so that we could say this is what our folks in our community want. One of the hardest things as being a council person is that you can't make everybody happy but at the same time, you can take time to listen to everybody. And, and, and you know, you gotta make tough decisions. And that's what we're elected to do. And that's why we get information day to day on here's what's important to the people in our communities. Yeah, just to add to that point from the council president, um, you know, when you're in our position, the listening never stops. Uh, we get it in the barbershop, the salon, the grocery store, everywhere about everything from potholes to how we should spend the ARPA money, as I talked to Lou in, in Starbucks a couple of days ago. Um, and one thing we intend to do as we roll out our ARPA process is more community conversations in town halls in the neighborhoods. So we're getting that feedback and that input from everyday residents, uh, more door knocking, talking to residents about our vision for ARPA and what it means for their respective neighborhoods and communities, working alongside city council to make sure we're getting the right feedback from all 17 wards about how we prioritize this spending and what it means for our city. And that's why I'm excited to endorse uh, this participatory budgeting process as part of ARPA to ensure that we are giving a residents um, a seat at the table in all 17 wards to influence how we spend a portion of this money. So um, from the county perspective, can you hear me okay? Talk right up to it. Thank you. It's kind of hard. So, from the county executive position, thank you all for letting me take his place for a little bit. Um, <laughs> one thing is, I, I know that there are so many committee meetings and decisions that are made in committee, and I just wanted to highlight community solutions and Will Tarter's ability to kind of put some of this board notify on, on social media to help people understand, even if you can't, especially in times of COVID, be at every one of the committee meetings that are making decisions. Um, using some of those board notify, and I saw Jenna in the audience too, using some of those social media tips to be connected with those people who aren't here in the room and making sure that they are here before a decision gets made and that they have an ability to kind of com um, to commit to being able to uh, communicate, not directly so all the time with the members of council, but also with those directors and those staff members that are making decisions. So I know, Lou, you're there each and every meeting, and it's great that you're there and you're a resource and advocate for so many things, but also to be able to use the tools of extra types of communication to make sure that we're connecting where possible. The other place I think is missing are 
Um, and I'm happy to see representatives from the hospitals here. I know Metro Hospital is trying to work and focus also on inside of the communities to bring those voices forward. So whether it's your hospitals, your libraries, or your school districts, to making sure that we're able to reach and help make other people our decision makers. Thank you. So I would say number one, neighborhood level meetings, both of existing organizations and special meetings for this purpose. And number two, for, uh, for uh, public officials to be accessible. Uh, I return all my calls, I answer my emails, and, 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 I, and, and I'm, I'm just uh, open to be approached about, about this. And, and uh, third, I would say that the, uh, the request for proposals that I put out for the, for the district two funds went to uh, about 50 organizations in and around my district, and I'm hoping and expecting that that's going to create a good amount of chatter and a and, uh, and, and lot of discussion. Thank you. All right, so our next question. Often discussions about how ARPA funds should be invested have focused on how they might be used to stoke economic development. How do we ensure that older adults who are no longer producers are properly cared for? I mean, let me say this to you, the, 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 I call them the gray tsunami that's coming back in the city of Cleveland that really have our empty nesters that are coming back in the city of Cleveland. One of the saddest things during the ARPA, and if you can just allow me just briefly to say this story, was an elderly lady who was living at home by herself during the pandemic and had no connectivity with the outside world. Um, unfortunately, her, uh, her only child that she had passed away, she had no family. The only connection with the outside world was pretty much me. And all she wanted to do was go to church on Sunday because that's what her social life, that's what her spiritual life, everything. But she didn't have brought her church moved to broadband. Her church moved to online. And, you know, that was the way for her congregation to stay in touch with her. Um, really being able to make sure that these elderly folks have access to broadband uh, for telehealth, because we have this telehealth that emerged through this process, making sure that they have access because of safety. Uh, you know, most community meetings moved online while we're talking about community meetings online. So, um, you know, but then also here's an elderly lady who's never probably touched a computer before that needs to understand the digital literacy, uh, that actually has to have the right equipment and actually has to have somebody to train her. So one of the things that we really focused on a lot, a tremendous amount of focus uh, in working with uh, groups, even, if, even with the children, uh, we worked with places like Digital C and others in order to try to make sure uh, that people had access to broadband. And that was across the spectrum. A lot of times people forget that the elderly folks uh, needed access to the broadband. So they might have said in the past, I don't want to touch that computer, but they had no choice but to do it for the last two years. So well, one thing I would add to that would be, you know, we want to try to spur through an inclusive economic development fund, a $100 million commitment around uh, inclusive economic development in the city of Cleveland. And to me, having a very focused strategy around senior home repair and our paint program are so important to this question so that our senior citizens can age in place and retire in the city of Cleveland and live a life of dignity because they're hardworking, tax-paying citizens in our city. I would also say, you know, this is why we have very two important evaluation principles in our framework around equity and inclusion and community impact. And seniors are a key part of that conversation because they represent a majority of our population in the city of Cleveland. So uh, I would say that the program that the county executive and the council ag agreed to uh, uh, covers the whole age spectrum and, and includes seniors and, and particularly the, uh, the funding for the Western Reserve Area and Agency Services also the broadband, also the, uh, the help for the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. And I would finally say that uh, something like uh, 
1.5 million uh, seniors across the country recently re-retired. And so questions of workforce development are, uh, are also relevant to, to seniors as well. Thousands of returning citizens are facing a housing crisis. Aside from the general affordable housing shortage, the challenges increase exponentially for those coming home to their communities. How are you planning to distribute funds to increase access to permanent supportive housing? Cuyahoga County has been working with a great number of partners on housing and has also put a lot of efforts into supporting reentry week, I think, which occurred two weeks ago. So I think part of the idea connected to that previous question with that push and pull, not only for seniors, but also for people returning to Northeast Ohio, is to continue to collaborate, work with partners to help make sure that we're using the rental assistance money in the best way we can with that. We're using infrastructure dollars that are coming through the federal dollars and assigning those in ways that we can, not only in Cleveland, but also in those other communities, especially in the inner ring suburbs, so that we're helping support their leadership to rebuild, make sure that there's affordable housing, and continue to work, again, with our anchors in this, in this society, our schools, our hospitals, and break down some of those barriers. I, I guess, it's that push and pull between economic development and taking care of us already. And I think that these ARPA dollars represent that one-time opportunity to move from reacting and responding to the COVID-19 crisis to build some resiliency among our region to protect our most vulnerable, but also help put us in a position we are attracting people to stay and to come in and live in Northeast Ohio. So I guess it all depends on relationships, relationships, relationships and continuing to have those conversations within those city council, county council, suburban mayors, Northeast Ohio leaders to make sure, as um, my boss said earlier, that we continue to have tough conversations, continue to meet on things that we agree on, and continue to meet on things that we don't agree on to get to the place we can, and to keep all of the folks that are in this audience today to help make sure that we're continuing to nudge and push so that we're moving forward for those people reentering. You know, Kate, I'm a big fan of having a triple bottom line approach to whenever we do anything, and that's social impact, environmental impact, and economic impact. A couple of great programs that I've seen that actually can help with um, having those three opportunities is looking at a program that's similar to Boston, where Boston actually has a program that supports electrification and renewable energy and solar panel and battery storage and on residential buildings and roof repair. Now think about that. So, you know, this is where we can take advantage of one of those opportunities where we might be able to help someone get a roof repair, but then also be able to get a solar panel so that they can participate in renewable energy and we can actually hit climate change and also deal with workforce because those are things that we want to try to expand upon is our renewable energy sector and be able to focus with areas like that. So it's really critical to look at best practices other other areas. I would also tell you that Buffalo has a great program that deals with affordable housing and making sure that we have uh, money to leverage the home funds that we have in place so that families that are displaced, uh, that we can invest in transitional housing. One of the um, one of the heavy lifts that I had this week while the mayor was uh, doing commencement speeches, I was studying, uh, you know, at uh, you know this big tax abatement proposal. And this tax abatement proposal is very good and it's interesting because part of the money that uh, is look at being done with this tax proposal is uh, developing a housing trust fund. And we could actually put more money and leverage that money with the housing trust fund that we're trying to put in the tax abatement proposal couple it with ARPA dollars in order to leverage home funds. That's the kind of leverage that the mayor is talking about in order to make sure that we can also hit the private sector, which we haven't talked about enough, uh, how we can make sure we leverage the private sector to put these kind of affordable housing options. We have to double down and focus on not just market rate housing in the city of Cleveland. We have to have more affordable housing units. And, and on that point, uh, kudos to everybody in this room that supported uh, city Council and the administration on uh, the 
tax abatement policy work that we've been doing. It's so important. And it also speaks to this question about the fact that for far too long, we've had a, a one size fits all approach to housing policy in this city. Uh, the residential tax abatement program is not a panacea to economic growth in this city. I'm gonna say that again, it is not a panacea. Uh, and we must leverage this moment with ARPA to really think about different incentives and additional programs to incent the right equitable inclusive growth long term. The other thing I think it's important to recognize in these questions is now you see our dilemma from senior housing to broadband to lead, the list goes on. So the number of uh, you know, investments folks wanna make far exceed the amount of money that we're, we're currently getting. And so that's why the how is so important, just as important as the what. These problems are vexing, they're structural, they're systemic. So we have to use this moment to hit home runs to make sure that 30 years from now, we'll say this was the time we got some of these things right and we built a more equitable future for our city and our region. So regarding permanent support of housing, uh, this is one step along a continuum. It, uh, it relates to, to people who, uh, who are no longer homeless, but, but who need permanent subsidy or, or assistance in order to, uh, to maintain housing. And uh, our, our, our plan primarily deals with other aspects of the housing continuum. It deals with homelessness, it deals with affordable housing gap financing, it, it deals with uh, vacant and abandoned housing demolition. But I would say that, that any action that uh, supports any parts of the system uh, uh, positively impacts the entire system because they, they all work together and we're dealing with permanent support of housing in other areas, particularly through, uh, through, through some different federal programs. Uh, I would also like to make a little correction. I, I earlier said 1.5 million senior citizens re-retired. I meant to say they unretired, mm -hmm. and that's what makes the uh, workforce development uh, relevant to them. Thank you. All right, so our next question is a two part. So the first part will be, this is about youth. What monies have been allocated for youth aging out of the foster system? And the second part of that is, how can we strategize the use of ARPA funds to help expose and create opportunities for our youth today and leverage organizations, and this is for all youth. So one question is specifically about youth and aging out of the foster system and housing, and then how can we leverage these funds to make sure we're creating opportunities for all youth? So just a couple of things, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't wanna put the county on the spot with this, but I do wanna say this. It's imperative for us to know the different lanes that government approaches mm -hmm. and we as a city are responsible for the health and wellness of our citizens we're responsible for the economic recovery of our citizens so once again number one is making sure that we have economic recovery for lost revenue that we lose in this process uh, to make sure that we can pay our bills number two is to make sure that we um, are focused on the infrastructure and the health and the wellness of our city which is why those mobile clinics and other things are so important the city has a specific role to take care of the health and wellness of our city and the infrastructure of our city the challenge that we're having another dilemma is that a tremendous amount of people are sending us requests for social services um, the county's primary responsibility is to be the social service safety net. So even though it might be imperative for us to submit some money and try to be helpful, because we know that those kids aging out of foster care are in our city, and we have to protect the health and wellness of our city, a majority and the lion's share of social service money comes from the social service safety net, from the health and human services levy that the county raises that 
we can be supportive of, but we don't, at least I don't believe, uh, should be the primary sponsor for those kind of things. Because once again, as I said earlier, it's about blocking and tackling and running an efficient government. Uh, that's first and, and foremost primary amongst our citizens. The council president is correct. And, and uh, there are two elements of the, uh, the county's uh, uh, ARPA plan that are very, very relevant to this population. And, and the first is the, uh, the expansion and improvement of the homeless care system because uh, a lot of the, uh, the uh, youth aging out of foster care uh, don't have a place to go and do end up homeless. And so we, uh, we serve them through this program and, and uh, help them uh, develop the ability to have their have their own homes, and the uh, the second part is workforce development. The uh, the uh, the youth are are often uh, unemployed or need assistance in in uh, in getting a, a good career path going, and and uh, and I would just have to stress how much our uh, our strategy in workforce development has changed over the last several years. It, it's no longer a matter of, uh, of how, how can we help them find any, any, any entry-level job and get off the uh, unemployment. The, uh, the strategy is, is uh, getting them into a career path that, uh, that starts at an entry level but leads to a se second step and a third step and a fourth step so that they uh, end up in a reasonable length of time with uh, truly living wage em employment that's meaningful and, and productive. All right, and no, you're fine. I would be remiss if I didn't get a chance to talk about education in some component today. Um, I, I just wanted to add one, one portion of this. The workforce development is, is critical and especially what the example that the Cleveland Schools has had with the SAEST education promise of a edu uh, college education after completion of 12 years in a Cleveland school. But what Eric Gordon and I believe some, uh, some members of the uh, people sitting right here have moved that from beyond just uh, 12th grade going straight to college, but to move even further down into sixth grade and fifth grade to kind of put people on the pathway for a career or college. And so I think the new PACE program that goes and moves workforce development down addresses that question about the youth. And then I know that the county executive and the team over at uh, county council are working on moving that without, outside of the boundary of just the Cleveland School District and into those inner ring suburbs so that families have choices starting as early as sixth grade to move students through and using ARPA dollars to help support their um, career or college readiness. So um, that's, those are some of the plans that, that we hope to help reach those youth. Thank you. All right, and this is our last question. You all mentioned equity as a key part of how you'll decide to distribute ARPA funds, but how do you plan to bring transparency and accountability to the process? And what role do you see the coalition, other groups, residents, and others playing, and what expectations can we have for responsiveness and public accountability. So uh, we are, we're really uh, trying to be thoughtful about these funds. They are unlike the CARES Act dollars that were previously um, reported under former President Trump. Um, these dollars have a lifeline that goes beyond just even the county executive's terms. And so we hired an organization called, I, let me, I always get the name wrong, Mar Dussel. Did I get it right? Mark Dissel. Um, it's an accounting firm to help us with that transparency to make sure that all of the many, 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 many compliance reports are done in such a way so that we can be um, transparent. As, as um, the executive and the team up here have already said, there are a lot of checks and balances between the council and the executive and a lot of different boards of control and um, accountability procedures. But I would also say that um, Kate, who's been really great at helping us kind of 
get everybody on the stage and together to continue to communicate about what's going to happen throughout the lifetime of this, these funds. Um, I think we're off to a good start. We've got experts who are helping us manage the funds beyond just the electeds. And then we continue to have conversations such as these to continue with um, moving forward and how the funds are spent. So I thank you for this opportunity. Well, uh, one of my favorite quotes about local government comes from the former mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg. He says, um, if you can't measure it, then you can't manage it, right? And so uh, my administration has been very clear about having a clear set of metrics across all of our priorities on our website, uh, the mayor's landing page. We also have our evaluation guide on our website. Uh, as we move forward to allocate the investments around the American Rescue Plan, we're gonna be launching an annual report that we'll have uh, publicly available to all the residents across the city. Uh, and we'll be working in the communities and neighborhoods to make sure that every resident has a clear perspective and a clear receipt on how we spent this money so they can hold me accountable uh, as their mayor. And it's so important uh, that we have a clear evaluation framework so that you know what was our rationale to how to spend this money so there's a really clear record of results and transparency moving forward. Transparency is essential and we have no choice but to be transparent as a council. Um, and I will tell you one of the things that I've done is made sure that my policy and research team are embedded with the uh, ARPA, this group, um, the ARPA coalition. ARPA coalition. And uh, <laughs> what that says. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, we also um, are going to be engaged. I know that they've met with uh, Mr. Whitehead and the mayors of Office of Economic Recovery and going to meet with other groups. Listen, city council has no choice but to be transparent. That's in our rules. That's in the law. So one of the things that, um, you know, that we uh, also are looking at doing is uh, we're going to have some, you know, televised conversations where we actually debate what we want to do. I've been very open. Number one, uh, one of the things that I've differed and done different than my predecessor is that I have monthly caucus meetings. And this is where we get to almost do parliament style debates where everybody gets to come together. And for those of you who are old school, not parliament funkadelic, like England, <laughs> England parliament, you know what I mean? So we actually have debates where council people actually really rigorously debate uh, you know, what we should do. We actually had two of these ARPA discussions where, you know, a lot of ideas were thrown out there and it's my job to officiate and try to make sure that we come up with a process. Uh, at the end of the day, Eight million, eight, we're eighth largest amount of ARPA dollars came into the city of Cleveland. Eighth largest. There's a lot of expectations. I call this one of these good problems uh, because, you know, there's a lot of pressure for us to get this right. So we want to make sure that we're transparent. But I have to say this. Um, transparent doesn't mean that everybody uh, gets to make a decision on this. I tell people oftentimes it's a democracy until it's time to make a decision. And then when it's time to make a decision, there's going to be people who actually benefit from it and people who don't benefit from it. But it's our job, and you put a tremendous amount of trust in 18 elected officials in the city of Cleveland, a mayor, a council president, and 16 other members of council. It's our job in order to really, at the end of the day, to make the tough decisions. And even though it's important to be transparent and give input, transparency doesn't mean that all y'all get to tell me what to do. <laughs> Transparency means that you guys get to make recommendations and we have to make decisions. And I will tell you, it's worked. We did it with the Lead Safe Coalition where 33 recommendations were made to council. We accepted 12, I mean, we accepted 26 out of the 33 and came up with a historical lead safe legislation that we believe is going to change the trajectory of this city. So we know how to be transparent as Cleveland City Council. We know how to work in collaboration. Um, we know how to make sure that the public's voice is heard. But at the end of the day, I just want everybody to realize that we have to make some tough decisions because when the mayor said hundreds of applications and Councilman Miller said hundreds. I would tell you that it might have creeped up into almost a thousand of people that send us recommendations to say what they wanted us to spend money on. And everybody is not going to get funded. So uh, I would start by saying that we created a 
a separate special fund to account for all of the ARPA money so that we can <clears throat> keep careful track and report on it. Also, uh, we hired a consultant. It's going to be, it's going to cost us about one tenth of one percent of the uh, total cost to make sure that we follow all the federal regulations and, and uh, and handle all of our uh, legal obligations in the way that this is done. Third, I would say that uh, we're going to hear from our consultants today at a, at a public hearing in, in the Finance and Budgeting Committee at County Council at 1 o'clock. And, and the, the Finance and Budgeting Committee is going to continue to be a vehicle for oversight and, and, uh, and and carefully tracking the use of the ARPA money to make, make sure that we remain on track. And finally, in terms of this uh, uh, overall philosophy, I would say that, that I also believe in participatory budgeting and, and that, the, uh, that the people should be uh, broadly involved in the process and have the opportunity to put out thoughts and recommendations. But I would also say that on county council, we, uh, we have elected officials who, who have spent years uh, focusing on this stuff day in and day out and, and developing experience and, and ex expertise. And, and, and I believe that we choose a elected representatives in, in this country for a reason, and, and that, uh, that we have to find the right balance in which it's very participatory on the one hand, but we also take advantage of the expertise and experience of, of the people that, that are elected to represent us. Well, thank you all for your responses. I, I just want to chime in with an addition that the American Rescue Plan is a little bit unique in terms of federal funding flowing through our local governments in that um, there are, you know, a lot of requirements around reporting and, and how that needs to look to the community. And as this work unfolds over the next uh, four years uh, until all the funds are spent, the Center for Community Solutions and the Greater Cleveland American Rescue Plan Coalition will be doing that work of tracking and helping break that down in a way that you, the community, can understand what's, what's happening here at our local governments. Um, I want to give a hearty thank you to our panelists for being here today and for all of their ongoing going work and attention to the important issues facing our community. Mayor Bibb, Council President Griffin, Councilman Miller, County Executive Budish, and Michelle Pomerantz. Uh, let's give them a round of applause and thank them for their participation today. And I think uh, what the fabulous turnout here today and the viewing audience on our live stream shows is that our community, everyone in this room, uh, and many more who are not in this room, are deeply invested in the success of these dollars. And that is why we are leading this coalition. Uh, we want to help partner with all of you in making these funds as strategic and as successful as they can be. And for that to happen, it will truly take a community collaborative effort. And so in the coming months, the Greater Cleveland American Rescue Plan Coalition will be engaging the community advocating at the local and at the state level, forming working groups, providing education, tracking and highlighting how these recovery funds are used, and more. And this is important work, and we are in it for the long haul. We have until 2026 to expend these funds, and we want to make sure that not a single dollar is left on the table. So more importantly, we can't do it without all of you here in this room. And so to all the folks who are in the room and to the folks who are watching on YouTube, we hope that you will join us in this work. Um, and I invite you to, uh, if you're interested in continued learning and advocacy related to Greater Cleveland's recovery from the pandemic, we invite you to join our coalition. And so if you get out your cell phone and you uh, scan the QR code that's behind me, or if you took one of those one-pagers, the QR code or the link are on the, the one page 
majors. If you didn't get one of those, I recommend that you get one on your way out the door. Uh, this QR code is going to take you to a survey where um, we can collect some information about you, what kind of programming you're interested in, how you'd like to be engaged, uh, your contact information, and we'll keep in touch with you with updates about the work, about ARPA spending in Greater Cleveland. Um, so I invite you to, to, uh, to take a moment to do that. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out this morning, and thank you again to our panelists. That concludes our first public meeting of the Greater Cleveland American Rescue Plan Coalition. Thank you, everyone, for your questions, your work, and your partnership. Uh, you are adjourned. <laughs>